Welcome, everyone. Thank you to my guest, Jay Nightmares, for joining me this episode. I hope you're ready for this. One of my friends knew about this disused cabin in the woods. It was built on the edge of a river on a kind of sandbank. There was a decline in the popularity of hiking and outdoor activities in the area due to a tragedy. It was practically deserted. So me and four other friends seized the opportunity. We planned to go and hike in that area and thought that we could use it if no one else was. When night fell, it was truly pitch black out there. You couldn't see your surroundings. It was a great night to be out in the wild. I loved the natural ambience. There was the constant trickle of the river mixed with the trail of insects. We heard what we thought was the sound of fingers drumming in the window pane. There was a nearby willow tree, so we assumed it must be the sound of a branch being dragged by the wind against the window. The lights were off early that night. We were all tired from the hike. Most of us were asleep in our own spot inside the cabin. It creaked now and then. There was the noise of people rolling over in their sleep. And of course, with five men in there, there was definitely some snoring. But other than those noises, it was a quiet night. We were miles from any city, town, or main roads. I couldn't sleep though. I was tossing and turning all night. We hiked and slept outdoors all the time. I don't know why I couldn't get to sleep that night. I had this unpleasant feeling in the pit of my stomach. I constantly felt like something was about to happen. I quickly found out what was causing my unease. The sound of the willow tree colliding with the window was getting louder. I listened closely and focused on the sound. It sounded to me like it was hitting different parts of the window. Then it sounded like it was coming from the other window. There were two windows in the cabin and they were at opposite ends to one another. I didn't remember there being trees outside of each window. And I felt my stomach tighten with that realization. There was a regularity to the sound as well. It didn't match the gusts of wind anymore. It was a steady tapping sound now. It was no longer the sound of branches dragging. It sounded deliberate. It was circling. The sounds of those taps and knocks were circling the cabin. I sat up to try and identify the source of the sound. I couldn't place it because the cabin wasn't at ground level. I couldn't look out the window from my sleeping bag to see. I needed to open the door. I knew that I wouldn't be able to sleep unless I checked. I tiptoed over to not wake the others. I was still thinking I was being paranoid at this point, and I didn't see the sense in waking my friends up with nothing confirmed. I slowly opened the cabin door with impeccably bad timing, for as soon as I opened the door, I came into contact with the source of the circling tapping sound. There was a young woman with long, messy, dark hair grinning at me. She was barefoot and wearing a nightgown. She was covered in mud. I screamed and my friends woke up. She had been tapping the window. She just stood there smiling at me. I instinctively shut the door and we had little other choice but to wait until morning. We had no cell phone reception in the cabin. We couldn't call the police. We later found out that the young woman was the daughter of the owner of the land we were trespassing on, and she'd done this before. I started to think back to the tragedy that happened around here. I think it was a missing person case or something. I wondered if she had something to do with it. I think we had a close call that night. She didn't know how she got there apparently. Her feet were so cut up that there was blood in the mud puddles she'd created by circling the cabin. I don't know how long she'd been circling us and what might have happened if I didn't get up to check. This happened when I was in the second year of college. Seven guys including myself went camping and I want to share with you what happened. We had this friend in the group who came from the countryside. He said to us that he knew of some little known place out in the mountains where we could all hang out during our summer vacation. He said we could go camping out by a mountain stream. So we all piled in two cars and headed out to the place he recommended. We drove for three hours. Our countryside friend told us that once we got on the highway, 
It would only take about an hour, and then when we got off the roads, we had to hike a mountain trail. It took about 30 minutes, but it felt like forever after that long drive. Some of those mountain roads were so narrow and overgrown that I was praying no one was coming in the opposite direction. One of the friends in my car remarked on how overgrown it was, to which my countryside friend replied, Yeah, no one knows about this place. It felt good, you know, like we were on an adventure. After a while, the mountain stream our friend promised came into view. It was amazing. It was surrounded by mountains, and it felt like we owned it. I don't know if that sounds a little arrogant, but that's how it felt. There was even a waterfall, and it wasn't a small stream. Maybe I should call it a river. It was wide in parts. We were alone. I mean that in the sense that we felt completely off the grid. I liked the idea, until I noticed a building jutting out of the mountains on the west. It looked like a school. We settled in after pitching our tents and had some lunch. We played around in the river, and when the sun began to set, we lit a campfire and drank. However, the snacks and the booze ran out quicker than we anticipated, so we split up. One team went on a booze recon mission, and the others minded our campsite. This happened at around 10pm. I didn't volunteer to go to the store, I was fine with just sitting around. We had no torches. We watched as our friends headed off under the watchful light of the moon in one of the cars. We turned on the headlights of the other car so we would have some light. The stars were beautiful, and the night was filled with the chirp of insects and the steady flow of the mountain stream. One of my pals broke the silence and said, What's that? I looked in the direction he was facing. He was looking at the school, and I saw that there was some kind of light coming from over there. It looked to me like someone was walking around with a flashlight. We spoke amongst ourselves. Someone said that they thought that there were some people out there doing some urban exploration. Someone else said that there was only one flashlight, so they doubted it. For the briefest of moments, it felt like the flashlight landed on us. We weren't far away enough to not be seen. Then the light went out. I figured that it was probably just a security guard or janitor, but my countryside friend said that the school was closed. We were all in high spirits, but now our enthusiasm was ebbing away. We all fell silent. It was already past midnight, and our friends hadn't come back from the store yet, so two others from our group said that they would go in search of them in the other car. Without the headlights, we could only rely on the campfire for light. My friend and I were the only ones left at the campsite, and after a few moments, he turned to me and asked, Sorry, but can I go to sleep before you? I'm so tired, man. He didn't wait for my reply. He just went into one of the tents nearby and settled down for the night. It sounded like he fell asleep almost instantly. I was alone. I watched the campfire. It was getting pretty creepy out there in the middle of nowhere. Our gang of seven, now down to just one, me. After a few moments, I noticed something. I saw a light coming from the direction of where we entered in our cars. I didn't see headlights though. The light looked like it was about a hundred meters away. I realized that it was coming from the woodland trail. It looked like it could be a flashlight. I started to get a little worried. I kicked dirt over the fire and then climbed into the closest tent. Unfortunately, it wasn't the one my friend went to sleep in. I put a sleeping bag around me. I had a bad feeling about whatever was approaching, but I kept my eyes on that light. I hoped that whoever it was wouldn't notice our campsite. I could see it move as if it was handheld. I started to wonder if it was the janitor or the urban explorer we saw earlier at the school. I wondered why the hell someone would be out here in the middle of the mountainous forest at this time of night. I piled some bags around me to create a little barrier, and then I stayed as still as I possibly could. I was sure whoever was out there wouldn't approach the tent that was zipped up. Surely they'd realize that someone was asleep or camping. I was wrong. I heard footsteps approach the front of the tent, 
followed by the chilling sound of someone unzipping the tent door. Then an old raspy voice spoke. You're not here either. I had goosebumps. I realized that it wasn't some janitor from the school. The voice belonged to an old woman. The old woman left my tent and then approached the tent that my friend was sleeping in. I didn't dare open my eyes, but I could hear her muttering something as she passed by. I knew that I wouldn't be able to catch a wink of sleep that night after this mysterious old woman decided to visit our tents. I lay there with my sweat amassing my brow, listening to the distant flow of the stream and the steady chirp of the night insects, praying for morning, praying for light. It was a long night. But when the first rays of the morning light illuminated my tent, I got up and went to see if my friend was alright. Thankfully, there was no one out there. I looked into the tent and saw that he was sleeping. I decided not to wake him. Neither of my friend's cars had come back that night. I started to get very worried for them, but after about ten minutes, I saw them both return to our campsite. I asked them what happened, and they said that the first car got a puncture and the second car, which went to look for them, got lost on the mountain roads. I told them all what happened last night, and no one believed me. We were set to camp out again that night, and they all thought I was just trying to scare them. I didn't want to stay there for another night, but I had no choice. I didn't drive out there, I got a ride, and it wasn't like I could walk back home by myself. I reluctantly spent another night out there. It was an uneventful night, and the following morning we all piled into the cars and headed back home. I purposely sat next to my friend who went to sleep early the night the old lady came to our campsite. He hadn't mentioned anything about it, and I wanted to know if he slept through it, or if he didn't want to tell the others because they hadn't believed me. I said to him something like, Did you hear what I said happened on the first night? I bet you're glad you went to sleep early, huh? I wasn't asleep. He replied. He said that, like me, he decided to stay as silent as possible. He said that the old woman actually went inside his tent, grabbed him and shook him. He opened his eyes a bit and saw that he wasn't dreaming and terror gripped him. He saw the old woman looming over him and attempting to shake him awake. He was so scared, but he said that he couldn't do much else but pretend to be asleep. She was mumbling the whole time. He said that he couldn't make out many words, but he said he will always remember one sentence. The old woman said, I don't know where my children have gone. Many years have passed since that summer, but I wonder if she's still out there. Even though I don't know if her intentions were either good or bad, I somehow feel for the old lady. That poor woman sounded as if she'd been out in the woods for a while. I always think about that night whenever summer rolls around. This happened during summer vacation, when I was at school. Back then there was an abandoned hotel in our neighborhood. I invited two of my closest friends to go urban exploring with me in that hotel one day. Let's just call my friends A and B. We first tried the front door, but it was locked, so we went around the back and found that that door was open. It wasn't like we were on a dare or we were ghost hunting or anything like that. It just felt like a good day for exploring and we were all free at the same time. As you might expect, the place was pretty trashed. We started in the lobby, looking around for anything interesting. Most of the rooms were locked, but we found a room on the fourth floor which was open, so we decided to make a base there. In the room, the smell of dust and mold wasn't that overpowering. The bed was pretty gross, so we pulled some chairs in from the lobby. Night crept in, and since there wasn't any electricity, we called it a night, but the next day we came back prepared. We all brought flashlights, and we headed to the hotel around lunchtime. We brought candles and snacks and drinks too. We were well prepared. We put all that stuff in our base room on the fourth floor and decided to check out the basement as we hadn't done the day before. 
us three descended into the basement with our flashlights in hand. Now this basement was huge, and there were rooms down there too, a lot of them. We were looking for a rope or something we could hold on to to make sure we stayed together and didn't get lost, because it was pitch black down there. It was so dark, I felt trapped down there. Even though it was lunchtime during summer, it was very creepy, and my friends seemed to feel pretty carefree, so I tried my best to hide my apprehension. We then found another room. In this room there was a box. In the box, there were keys. We left the basement with the box of keys to see if they would work on any of the locked doors upstairs. The keys had room numbers on them, but they wouldn't work on the doors that matched the number on the key. We couldn't work it out. Maybe there was some auto lock in place or a deadbolt or something. We were just glad that our room on the fourth floor was open. We decided to look for a key that wasn't a guest room key. And we found a key that said, waiting room, written in pen. Now this key was different to the other keys and it did not look that official. What I mean by that is it's not the kind of key you would get from the front desk. It looked like some kind of janitor key. We noticed a locked door in the basement, which had a sign, and that sign read, Waiting Room. So we headed back down there again. We tried the key in the lock, and the door to the waiting room unlocked with a click. The door opened a crack and we were confronted by a terrible stench. We asked one another about what that smell could be. Was it something rotten or dead? I was really freaked out now. Down there, in the dark basement with this new terrible smell, I said, come on guys, let's go back. And A said to me, what? You don't want to know what's in here? And I just replied, no man, it's dangerous. Let's, let's just go. And then B said, oh, come on, just hold your nose. We'll all take a quick peek. A carelessly pushed the door open and shone his flashlight inside. The flashlight revealed a mannequin, what looked like it had blood all over its clothes. There were dead animals in the room too, strewn all over the place. Knives were stabbed into the mannequin. We all began shivering. I could tell A was because his flashlight was shivering as it scanned the room to reveal scratches in the wall and on the door. I felt my blood turn ice cold. I couldn't take any more. I just ran, and my friends ran with me. We ran through the lobby and out the back door, and continued running up the street for about a hundred meters. We were all clamoring, screaming, and going crazy about what we had just witnessed. Why were there so many dead animals? And, and the blood? And the mannequin? B was pale, and we looked at him, and he said in a quiet voice, Don't you think? That thing on the floor, just to the right of the mannequin, looked like a human foot. It was that point we found his breaking point. He started to cry, and we all went home. I didn't even want to leave the house for about three days. It was around this point that I remembered I had left my bag in there. I didn't want someone to find it and then find me. I was too scared to go back to the hotel by myself, so I called my friends again, and they reluctantly agreed to go with me. We approached the back door with fear weighing heavily in our hearts. I reached out a shaking hand and I tried the door, but it was locked. This was about eight years ago. I often tremble in my bed at night when the lights are off, remembering that event. That hotel has now been renovated into retirement homes, but I can still see the waiting room in my head. This happened to me when I went on a fishing trip with my dad. My dad absolutely loves to fish, and he would always invite me. I like fishing, sure, but I guess I wasn't as passionate about it as he was. He loved mountain stream fishing, and I will be honest, that was probably my favorite too. So on the first day mountain fishing was an opportunity to do, we were ready to go. 
This all happened when I was in elementary school, by the way. I think I was about six. I remember it very well, not only for the reasons that will become clear shortly, but because it was the first time we ever went deeper into the mountainous woods. We never went in that far before, but I think that the year prior yielded a fruitless fishing hole, so my dad wanted to go in search of a new fishing spot. The stream we used wasn't a secret amongst anglers, and there would always be a bunch around dotted either side of the length of the stream. It was common to see tents along the side of the streams. These numbers grew less and less the further you went into the darker woods. The mountain provided that darkness. The much-needed shade was welcome, but with darkness came fear, especially for a boy my age. I knew that mountain stream fishing wasn't as peaceful as it seemed. There were dangers everywhere, and I thank my dad for making me aware of them. You could fall, get lost, get an injury, wind up in distress, and you could also encounter a wild animal such as bears. My dad and I had a radio for these instances and bear repellent. My dad actually used to bring fireworks out too, you know, like firecrackers or something. He believed that this would frighten off something or alert someone to our position should we need it. He took all manners of precaution on our fishing trips, and I'm so glad he did. So that day, we were in search of the perfect fishing spot, and it seemed as if we'd found it. We could see that the stream was teeming with life. There were fish everywhere. We approached it from above, and all we had to do was descend the mountain a bit. So that's just what we did. We headed down with big grins on our faces. On the way down, I noticed something. There was a tent. There was a smell in the air, too. It wasn't great. It was pretty awful. Food containers, clothes, and other personal items were scattered around the tent. The tent was ripped, too. Something was wrong. And even to my young mind, I knew what had happened. This was the work of a bear. We had no idea if the bear was still nearby. With that thought at the forefront of my mind, I began to tremble. My dad had kept walking, although he had stopped speaking. He was approaching the tent. I thought he was going to see if the man in the tent was okay. I was certain that the man in the tent must be dead. There was so much destruction around. It was a harrowing scene. My dad stopped turned to me and said, don't touch anything, nothing at all, the bear will be back, we have to go. I can't describe how I felt on the way back to the car, but it felt like I wasn't living, just existing, like the life in me was on pause. I'm not sure if that means anything to anyone, but hey, that's how it felt. I had never been conscious of death until that day, death was so cruel. Nature was so indifferent. We found out once we reported the tent to the mountain ranger that the man was indeed dead. They believed the bear was still out there. There's nothing much more I can say. Be careful when you're in the mountains and the woods. Keep your wits about you and survey your surroundings. This happened about five years ago, and back then I was really interested in photography. Whatever time I could take off work, I used to go traveling to take photos. It was autumn, and I planned to visit a rural village that lied in the shadow of the mountains. I could already imagine the colors of the leaves, and I was really looking forward to it. The area was very traditional, and that I mean it was like looking into a picture from the past. It was a proper rural agricultural village, and my eyes bulged at its beauty. My head was brimming with the ideas for photos. When I say it was a rural village, I'm not talking about a couple of fields. The mountains that stood over it were truly beautiful. There was some kind of eccentricity to this village I couldn't put my finger on. I tend to look for beauty in unusual places. I remember that there were some flat lands where beautiful yellow flowers I hadn't ever seen before were growing. They hadn't been leveled or cut, they were just there in their own patch. I loved it. The forest floor was littered with fallen autumn leaves, 
I was fascinated with my surroundings. I wanted to immerse myself in nature. I sat down on the forest floor for a while. On my first day in the village, I decided to stroll through the forest and shoot some photos. I got a little away from the village and I found a natural path in the forest which led to the mountains. The path twisted left and right and there were these huge boulders littering the way, like buttons on a giant's coat. I went up the path and there was a clear barrier between me and the trail to the mountains. It was a rope tied at waist height. Here in Japan, they're called Shimanawa and you might have seen this kind of rope at shrines as it's usually at an entrance to mark its sacred nature. The thing is, in public places like shrines, they aren't tied at waist height. They're usually high up allowing people to pass underneath them. This was intentionally either stopping people from going any further or stopping something else from coming any further, depending which way you looked at it or what side of the rope you were on. I found it very interesting and I really wanted to push on and climb over, but since the sun was setting, I decided not to brave the unknown and head back to my inn. Later that night, I asked the innkeeper about the path I found in the mountains. He told me not to go back up there. He said it wouldn't be a good idea to cross over that rope and head further up the mountain, as many people have been known to disappear on that path. I thought about it, and maybe the innkeeper was just saying that to keep me out of there or that he heard many stories from the villagers which made him believe that the mountain path was off limits. I thought that there wasn't much to his story, so the next day I decided to head back up there again without telling anyone. I headed up there early, but everyone was already up. I had to wait for the villagers to stop watching me that morning before I could make my move. Word travels fast out there, I guess. I was heading back up the path and I was thinking... Nothing happens when you go past that rope. It's fine. It's just a mountain. Once I passed the rope, the mountain path and its surroundings seemed to double in its beauty. Yet the path remained the same, like it had been walked many times before. It seemed quite a depressing path. I was walking along as if I were in a dream. The scenery was the same either side of the path. I grew a bit nervous. I was most worried about getting lost. After a short while, I found a body of water. It was like a swamp kind of stream, so I started heading up the path, keeping parallel with that. That way, I could always follow it back down. After a while, the path gave way to the natural barrier that was the mountain. I was kind of disappointed, to be honest. I figured that there wasn't much else worth checking out, and I almost decided to head back. But that's when I noticed it. Alongside the steep mountain was a hollow indent, and there was a house built into the mountain face. Well, it wasn't a modern house. Maybe a hut or lodge would be a more accurate description of it. The walls were white with a tiled roof. It looked like it was in pretty decent condition too. I felt someone could have come out of the house at any moment, and I didn't want to get caught on what I guessed was their property since I passed through the rope, so I turned on my heels and went to get out of there. I headed back down towards the village. Halfway back to the inn, I was suddenly stopped by a person calling out to me. Ah, shit. I felt guilty. I'd just been caught doing something I shouldn't, so I climbed up and didn't say a word. I turned around to see what kind of trouble I was in. I saw an old guy I recognized. There was the guy who lived across from the inn. I said hello to him a couple of times. He was sat on top of a big rock. He told me off and I deserved it. He said there were bears out there. I apologized a bunch of times and told him I would head right back. He said he would take me back. He shouted at me at how lucky I was that I didn't go any further. He said there were things out there worse than bears too. That's when I noticed he was holding a gun in his hand. I asked what the gun was for. He smiled and said, Just self-defense. He was a trapper and he said he never once used the gun, but knowing what he knew about the area, he said it would be a stupid idea not to bring it each time he went past the rope because of the bears. He said the bears have always been there. People who did what I did are the people who go missing. Sometimes it's not a cryptid, insane person in the woods, 
or a missing 411 story, sometimes it's people like me who willfully ignore the rules. And if it wasn't for that guy, I might not be here sharing this. It seems like a miracle I got out of there alive. This happened back in my university days, when a friend and I were on our way back from a trip. On the way back, I guess I must have misread the map or we took some kind of shortcut because we got lost somewhere on the mountain roads. My friend was driving, and I was supposed to be the navigator. It was the one job I had. It was around 8pm, but it was already really dark since we were in the shadow of the mountains. I noticed a white truck up ahead. And I said to my friend, if we followed the truck, we would probably get back to a main road in no time. I thought it was a pretty sweet plan, because I didn't have a clue where the hell we were, let alone what mountain we were on. We were tailing the truck for a while, and then we realized we were going further and further from the main road, and further into the desolate mountain roads. We started to worry as the roads turned to dirt roads, one lane roads. The truck, more suited to these roads, sped up, and we lost sight of it. It was weird and kind of unlikely for the truck to disappear all of a sudden. There was nothing ahead of us apart from dark, dirt mountain roads. It was playing on my mind, but our priority was getting back on a main road. I was flipping through a map with a torch held in my mouth. There was no cell phone coverage. We were going further down the road when I noticed some lights behind our car. I looked in the wing mirror and noticed a white truck behind us. It was the white truck we had been tailing. I told my pal what I'd just seen, and we both watched the truck in the mirrors. We began to get a little creeped out by this. The truck then turned its lights off. Is it even possible to navigate these winding mountain roads with the lights off? I wondered. It was getting really freaky now. I was nervous and I could tell that my friend was nervous too. I stated the obvious at this point. I think that truck from before is behind us, man. It's following us now. As soon as I said that, I began to sweat. My friend shifted nervously in his seat too. He sped up to test my theory, and the truck behind sped up to catch us. Still, with its lights out, we didn't know what to do. We began to argue about it. It was incredibly tense. Then suddenly, the truck behind us seemed to disappear. It felt totally hopeless. Whoever was in the truck clearly knew the roads. I really wish we didn't decide to follow that guy. We kept going forward on the one lane road, keeping an eye out for a chance to turn back, sending snappy, bitey remarks to each other about how we could get out of this mess. Then seemingly out of nowhere, the truck swerved into our lane again and slammed on its brakes. My friend reacted in time and once again we were behind the white truck. He said, if we don't do something, it's gonna end bad mate. This was the worst. I've never felt so stressed out. A moment or two later, we reached a point where the road got wider and my friend took his chance. We span into a U-turn. There wasn't too much space to turn, so my friend's car kissed the guardrail. On our escape, we noticed points in the road where the truck could have disappeared and appeared in front of us. That answered the question of how it was possible, but we still had the unanswered question of why. Why was this guy doing this to us? We knew that we were on our way back to civilization, so my friend floored it while I kept nervously glancing over my shoulder to see if the truck was following us. I kept asking him to speed up, but I knew that he couldn't. That truck could pop out of nowhere again at any moment. So we kept heading down those dirt roads until eventually they became concrete again. I saw the lights, lights of people's homes, and before long we came across a non-franchised gas station. My friend immediately pulled in and we skidded to a halt. My friend ran in and grabbed the clerk by his arm and frantically explained the situation. He asked the guy to call the cops and for directions to get off of these mountain roads. The clerk didn't seem that interested in our plea for help, so we got him to go outside. My friend then said, You have to believe us, there's some guy chasing us. Okay then, if a white truck with all its lights off turns up at any second, then will you believe us? And just as he finished saying that, the truck arrived with its lights still off. 
It screeched to a stop a few meters away from the gas station. Then, it slowly turned around and headed back into the darkness. We weren't able to get a look at the driver, but we noticed something. There was some sort of logo and some text on the side of the truck. The clerk at the gas station said, Oh, oh, <laughs> now I get you. The guy's from the church, huh? What? Oh, I say church, maybe cult's a better word. I pressed him for more information, and it turns out that apparently the entire mountain is their territory. They own a village, and the leaders and the followers all live there together. I understand that there are cults in Japan, but I didn't understand why that truck was following us. So I asked, and according to the old fellow at the gas station, there are frequent attempts to escape by followers of the cult who changed their mind. So the cult are very wary of cars getting anywhere near their village. Their reckless driving and relentless pursuits of anyone who gets close to the village is said to be the cause of numerous accidents up here in the mountains. I remember that the cult featured quite heavily on the news and in the media a few years after, but it seems to have gone radio silent since. I guess that guy who followed us was a lookout for escapees or for families trying to rescue their loved ones or something. It was a very creepy experience. I live with my wife, daughter, and son in an apartment. We live out in the countryside in a suburban area. It's a really quiet place and rarely any crime occurs here. With it being so peaceful and pleasant out here, I often left the front door to our apartment open on hot days to allow the air to circulate through our apartment. This experience happened a few mornings ago. I was looking after my daughter and son while my wife went out to run some errands. I'm thirsty. My five-year-old son said as he rushed into the kitchen. If I'm in the living room, I can see the fridge, so I kept an eye on him. Something was different that day, though. My son was looking at something. After he got his drink, he dropped it in the hole. He was looking in the direction of our front door. I looked at him and asked him what he was doing. He didn't reply. He just stood there, staring at the front door. I saw a look of concern pass his face. He was stood completely still. I didn't like this, so I got up and headed towards him, and I looked in the direction he was staring in. There was a man in our hallway that I'd never seen before. He looked to be in his twenties. He was dressed for summer, but there was something off about him. He gave off a strange vibe. It's kind of hard to describe. I mean, of course he gave off a weird vibe. He was stood in my house, but there was something else up with him. He appeared to be out of breath. He was just looking around our place with these quick little side glances. For a moment, I was literally unable to move. I was as still as a statue. Then I snapped out of it. I had children to protect, and when that thought came to the forefront of my mind, the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. It was fight or flight time. I raced over and grabbed my boy. I shouted at the intruder, What the hell are you doing in here? I'm just tired. I'm basically outside. Just give me a second here. He replied, No, what the hell are you doing here? Answer me. He just stood there smiling, not saying a word. To me, it looked like he was considering his options or he was scheming. I guess that my daughter had heard what was going on as I saw her head peeking out of the living room doorway. No matter what I said to the guy, he gave me nothing but nonsensical answers. He was utterly incomprehensible, and that troubled me. Was he buying time? We stood there in silence, two men, two strangers facing one another, both of us seemingly unable to understand one another. My mind was racing. I clearly had to consider other options, so I thought to myself, do I get a knife from the kitchen? Do I have to hit the guy? Obviously I didn't want to do anything like that in front of my kids. Why didn't this guy just leave? If he wanted something, why couldn't he ask? All these questions were going around in my head. He stood there with his eyes darting about my home, and then would come back to mine. 
While I was considering my options, a young man dashed out of my house. I then heard a voice shout, Hey, you, wait, at the man. A uniformed police officer was rushing towards my place. I was really confused, but I was relieved, glad that he left. But how did the police know to come here? My daughter came up to me from the lounge and told me that she called the cops. She's a smart kid. I made a report with them. Afterwards, I heard from the officer that the young man had been going around that day exposing himself to residents. I found that disturbing. The reason the police were able to respond so quickly to my daughter's call was because they were already en route. They were in the area. A neighbor had placed a call complaining about a man in the area running around being gross. You know, like I said. The officer said that the intruder must have felt like he'd been backed into a corner, and that's why we had that weird standoff in my home. The officer then said something that stayed with me. We're fairly certain that he was doing this. He was out of his mind, and with that, he gestured a syringe to his forearm. I don't know. I guess I had a tear in my eye when he said that. He was so young. Even though he terrorized my family, in those brief moments we stood eye to eye with one another, and he'd done other stuff. I just thought, what a waste. Anyway, don't leave your door open in the summer. You never know who might turn up. I'm just glad that I didn't decide to run those errands that morning. I cannot imagine what might have happened if he found my wife and kids home alone. I might be telling a different story. I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago by myself and my two dogs. We were four days in, around 20 miles at least as a crow flies from even a known mountain road. I was camping at around 7,000 feet that night, or right where the tree line started thinning out. So, when we got to the campsite, a big open meadow on top of a secondary mountain, it was just about an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp as I put up the tent and make dinner. But, I noticed this time was a bit different. He kept staring up the steep, tree-filled mountainside, tail straight up and barking. Not the bark when he sees marmots, not the excited, oh you fucks are lucky because I'd rip you all apart if my master wasn't here, high-pitched barks, but unsure, concerned barks. Now, the day before I'd found a note left under a rock at the last landmark saying that there was a problem bear in the area that was harassing a party of campers a few days ago, and I myself had seen big cat tracks the day before, so I was rightfully concerned that this may be more than just ground squirrels. I decided to go climb some of the boulders at the foot of the hill while I took my time looking up the hillside for movement, before I went to go hang my bear bag up there. They were the only trees around to hang the bag from. I didn't see or hear anything but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So, while still concerned, I start hiking up this steep hill to hang the bag. It was so steep, I had to use the trees to balance and lean against so I didn't go tumbling down, before making another five to six step push to the next tree I could lean against. Anyway, I'm slowly making it up this hill, hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance. Then I get about, a hundred feet up the hill, and I hear a whole lot of big movement about fifty feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep low growl to a savage, slobber flying everywhere type barking now. My heart starts pounding out of my chest, and I start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in a matter of seconds, because if this is a bear, my dog is going to try to save me, in which he will most likely die, and I'm stuck here. If I have to get off that hillside fast, I almost 100% am going to trip and fall off the 12 to 15 foot cliff onto the boulders below. So I'm feeling pretty screwed about now. Then I hear my other little dog start barking and freaking out down at my campsite, which was just out of sight. I had zipped her in my tent so she didn't wander off while I was away. So yeah, 
I'm absolutely panicking at this point. A few seconds after, I kind of snap back to it, and I take another few seconds to start to put my survival priorities in order, and I call my dog back to me. He gets to me and sits at my feet, as my back is against a tree, so I'm kind of pinned and stuck there for the moment, but my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there, so I let him lean against me while I try to collect myself. This is when I realized I'd completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. I reach up so fast to turn my lamp on, I basically punch myself in the face. I'm having serious adrenaline dumps going on right now, so much so that my knees are starting to shake. I get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection off the eyes of whatever's up there. Peering. Peering. Nothing. But I just heard something. We both did. And whatever it was, it didn't get away or sound like it had made it too far. I knew something was there, so I'm kinda just steadfast at this point. I need to know what is up there because I have to sleep here tonight. And you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone. Better to face it than wait like a sitting duck all night is my thought process. So yeah, as I'm looking up this hill, and at one point my dog lunges forward, unpinning me, he does a bluff charge up the hill about 15 feet, and I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does this, I finally see movement. Something moving up and breaking the line of the horizon. My dog's bluff made whatever it was blow its cover, so I'm zeroed in. I call my dog back and silently watch, and what I made out made my heart completely drop. There was a man crouched about 75 feet directly in front of me, wearing not camo clothes, but some raggedy shit with a hood that blended into the environment perfectly. Actually, it was almost like a makeshift ghillie suit, but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes, and his face was covered in dirt or something, but I knew we were staring right at each other at that moment. So, I stare, for what seems like minutes. No words. I felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground, I wanted him to know I saw him, but I guess I was just too shaken to speak. As I'm staring, my little dog at the backside started to bark her head off again, like she was scared, and I also had to get off that hill before total dark, or I could be seriously hurt or risk dying trying to get back down. So, carefully, I start heading down the hill with my dog, who doesn't want to leave but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree holding me up and look in that direction again, just to make it even more clear I saw him, and eventually I make it down to the boulders at the bottom. By the time I finally jumped down and hit the boulders, my little dog has stopped barking. I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought she was barking just to bark, or just barking back at my dog, but when I get there, my little dog had somehow made it out of the tent and was walking around the campground growling, with her tail sticking straight out. Still trying to hold it together, I thought. Okay, maybe she just got her nose between the zippers and worked her way out, but I was positive I'd zipped it so that the zipper was at the very top of the tent door, out of reach. So, in a mixture of being terrified, pissed off, and the feeling of needing to do something, I reached into my day bag and pulled out my 40 caliber. I fire a single shot into the air as the sun was setting. I climb into my tent without eating, and I lay my gun next to me until first light. As soon as the sun came up, I was packing up my shit and leaving, heading back down the mountains. It sucks. It was all downhill back, but I still couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time I made it to the last camp, about four miles from my vehicle, but thankfully there were other people there. We sat around a fire they made, and I felt pretty relieved and safe. They start to tell me they're planning to head the way where I was the night before in the morning, so I tell them my story in detail. Needless to say, we were both walking back to our cars in the morning. Screw all that. 
The thing that still creeps me out to this day, though, is when I got home and started reading reviews of the same hike I was on, other people had similar experiences like mine as well. Even a man found dead from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago. And a woman found murdered last year. I grew up in the Midwest. About 10 years ago, I moved to a small coastal town in the Pacific Northwest, where I would work for a company that runs cabin rentals and a water taxi service, transporting campers and hunters, and sometimes freight, to various locations, sometimes just 20 minutes away, sometimes hours away. During the winter a few years ago, we had a couple staying in one of our very basic cabins, like the kind of cabin you'd stay in at summer camp. My understanding was the guy was taking a class at the trade school in town, so he'd be gone all day, while the woman, Jane, stayed at the cabin with their three dogs. We never saw her outside while he was away. One day, Jane burst into the office in tears, hysterical. She told us Richard had been beating her for days, starving her, that he'd been locking her in the cabin while he was away, that he even threatened her with his dogs. We immediately called the police to the office, and while we waited for them to arrive, she told us the details of their relationship. Jane was from South Africa and came from quite a wealthy family. Her father had recently passed away and she received quite a large inheritance. She met Richard on this social media site, and he sold her on this bogus dream of building a remote lodge, and it even convinced her to transfer all this money she just inherited to his bank account which he spent on a remote piece of property, a new truck, and a boat, among other things. Jane was totally at Richard's mercy. She'd voluntarily transferred the money to him. It was evident that she'd grown up wealthy. She didn't seem to have any idea how to take care of herself. By the time the police arrived, she reversed her story. She wouldn't tell them that he'd hit her, threatened her, or locked her in the cabin. I walked over to the cabin with the officer to talk to Richard, and of course he denied everything. The cop was very frustrated. It was clear Richard was mistreating her, but he didn't have enough to make an arrest. I told Richard he needed to leave the property anyway. I didn't want him there, and the woman didn't want to go with him. Jane had managed to get in touch with a friend in the US who bought her a plane ticket and another employee and I had offered to drive her to the airport in the city, about 200 miles away that very night. Richard left without issue, and the last thing I said to him was don't come back, and if I ever saw his truck in our area again, I would assume he was there to cause trouble and would call the police without hesitation. I felt terrible for the woman. She basically made a bad investment and had little hope of recovering any of that money. Months pass, it was well into the summer and I'd all but forgotten about this incident. I'd heard Jane had gone back to Richard and they were back in town from another water taxi operator. He'd been transporting them to and from their remote property because Richard wrecked the boat that he bought with Jane's money on the rocky beach. One day I answered a phone call from a very distraught woman from the other side of the country. She was desperately trying to find her son, who had answered an ad Richard had posted online looking for help doing construction at the remote property. She'd just been calling the water taxi operators in the area, asking if anyone knew this guy Richard. Apparently her son Mike had called her from a satellite phone out at the property. He told her he was in danger. They weren't getting along and Richard finally ran him off. This property was out in the middle of nowhere, accessible only by sea or air. There were no roads. You can't just tell someone to leave. Where would they go? Mike's mother relayed to me that Richard wouldn't let him sleep in the cabin, that he wouldn't share food, and that he'd even chased him with a rifle when he realized Mike had the sat phone. It was lucky he managed to get the call out. Mike's mother called with the intention of hiring us to pick up her son. I told her, Miss, this is an emergency. We need to contact the police. I contacted the state police and Coast Guard immediately, and they jointly dispatched a boat and a helicopter to the area to rescue this guy. Mike was rescued safely, 
and Richard was arrested. Jane was there too, but she refused to come back with the police. She stayed at the cabin. Mike came out to the office a few days later to meet me. He gave me a big hug and thanked me. He was convinced I'd saved his life, which was a nice sentiment, but in my opinion the police and coast guard saved his life. He told me some more details of his experience, that Richard had actually taken several shots at him while he was chasing him through the woods. He told me when Richard caught up to him, he held him at gunpoint, ordered him to strip naked, and locked him in a shipping container that he had on the property. He was convinced he was going to die. He was still locked in the shipping container when the state police arrived. Mike didn't stay for long, but I was impressed that he took the time to come out and introduce himself and I wished him luck. Richard was charged with attempted murder, but I believe those charges were ultimately dropped and that Mike had ended up with a hefty settlement from the inheritance money Richard had swindled from Jane. I received a phone call later that summer from a reporter in the city asking about what had happened. Mike's mother had given him my information. I agreed to tell him what I knew on the condition that he not mention my name or the name of the company I work for. The other night I was having a few beers with my neighbor Al, a young guy who moved to town last year. This story popped into my head, and when I mentioned Richard's name, he perked up. They worked together at the shipyard. I can't believe it. This fuck is back in town, without Jane this time, working a minimum wage job. So Richard, you lord of the fly psychopath, let's not meet again. Growing up in the Appalachian Mountains, I could give you a million times as a kid and young adult that I felt scared or paranoid playing in the woods. It's a beautiful place, and I spent my entire childhood getting lost out there by myself or with friends. As kids, we never got too far out there, but you actually could see the progression of us venturing further and further out as we got older due to the forts and carvings we would leave. This one particular time, like a thousand times before, my friend and I had just graduated high school. It was our last summer of freedom, and we spent the entire summer camping and hiking out there. We had decided to try and find a new place to set up camp and walked for what felt like a few miles before we came to a nice clearing. The area was relatively new to both of us. We got the camp set up and fire going, and the plan was to wait until nightfall, smoke some weed, and play some Monopoly. For sake of backstory on my friend and I, my buddy is a smaller, real goofy guy, but he comes from a family of foresters and always had a deep understanding of all the trees and different plants you came across. He had no fear of going and camping out by himself. If I spent 10,000 hours in the woods, he probably spent 50,000. As for me, I'm a taller, sturdier guy, and as we got older, I spent more time worried about women and sports, and the woods became a place for small parties. Also, I never had the balls to camp out alone. In fact, older me wouldn't go far at all when I was alone because I could never shake the feeling of being watched, which was just paranoia, but it was still an uneasy feeling. Anyway, camp is set, fire is going, but it's getting lower and needs wood. Sun is down and we're both cutting up and having a good time. My friend is sitting on this little chair he always brought and loading up the makeshift bong, and I was crouched breaking some excess limbs off some of the logs we gathered for the fire. All of a sudden, this strong breeze cuts through the clearing. I couldn't tell you if it was the suddenness of it or what, but my friend and I both stopped immediately and looked at each other. The breeze went just long enough to flicker our fire down to a small flame. We both sat still in almost total darkness. Neither of us said a word. Across from us on the other side of the fire, we could hear footsteps. They sounded like someone was running and would slow down to a walk and then run again, definitely on two legs. By the sound of it, they were pacing back and forth over the same spot. Then, just like it had started, it stopped with a softer crunch on the underbrush. 
but I knew by the sound of it they'd taken a crouch. I was crouched still and knew I was staring right at it in the dark. My friend grabbed my shoulder and said, Buddy. And when he did, I felt this surge of fear come over me. I could feel it and hear it in him. I'd been so fixed on the footsteps and rationalizing what I'd heard that I hadn't even considered being afraid. But this was true fear. It was raw and made me feel helpless. I could hear my friend after a while grab some leaves and he dropped them on the fire. For the split second the leaves covered the fire, we were in pure darkness. Then the fire sprang to life. We both quickly grabbed more leaves and brush and threw it onto the fire. I got some sticks and logs on there and neither of us took our eyes off the spot or moved much for over an hour. Finally, the leaves crunched and it slowly walked off. Whatever it was had sat crouched watching us without moving for far longer than any animal would. It wasn't until after those footsteps disappeared that I realized the smell had disappeared as well. It smelled like a paper mill, spoiled eggs almost. For the rest of the night, besides whispered remarks, neither of us really moved or stopped looking at that spot. Nobody went into the tent, and I had very short light sleep sitting on the ground with my head rested on my hands. My friend never went to sleep. In the morning we packed up and silently walked home. To this day we talk about it. In the seven to eight years since it happened, my forester friend has not camped out there by himself since. So, I live in a country that was pretty rural until the last 10 to 15 years. The biggest town in our country is pretty crowded now. Overcrowded and I hate it. I moved from there to the countryside. I like where I live, except it can be really creepy at night. Because for miles and miles it's dark with no street lights. One thing about this country is that the main roads always get backed up really quick or there's an accident or whatever so it pays to go the back roads. The back roads, like any other rural place, are less populated, dark, has lots of trees. There are no sidewalks. Anyway, a few years ago something happened that almost made me stop using them. I was driving home kind of late one night. I decided to take one particular back road that shaved off 10 minutes from my commute home. I was tired and had to get up early, so I was going fast trying to get home soon. This road is a little more populated than some, but it's really spooky in some stretches because huge trees are along the side of the road and their branches and leaves make a tunnel of sorts. So, I'm zipping through and round a curve. Up ahead, I see what I thought was a giant garden flag. You know the flags that people put up in spring in their yards? Well, I thought it was a weird flag because it seemed like it was very tall and large and it was in the middle of the road. As I got closer, my headlights hit it, and it's not a flag. It's a person. A lady. She was wearing a red fez, a long flowy white dress, and an orange reflective sash across her chest. A little strange because she's in the middle of the street. As I drove past her, it got weirder. As dark as it was, as I drove by, I could see she was about 60. She had glasses and I could see her bright blue eyes. She looked in my passenger window and she started doing this weird bounce thing. I thought she was going to try and get into my car. Mind you, I'm going pretty fast. I don't know what it was about her, but she freaked me the fuck out. I didn't think she would rob me. I really thought she was a soul snatcher or skinwalker. I honestly didn't think she was human. I can't adequately describe how creepy she was. I sped past her as fast as I could. I kept glancing into my back seat to make sure she'd not materialized in my car. I prayed, recited scripture, and kept watch in my rearview mirror. It was spring so it was a little warm, but I felt bone-chillingly cold. I finally made it home and I run to tell my mom the story. I got in just as my brother was telling my mom about this weird lady he saw while he was driving. It was the same lady, 
but he saw her at the inspection from the highway and the back road whereas I saw her further down the road. We both had the same reaction. She also tried looking in his car. She was also bouncing around when he saw her. He said there was a car in front of him that sped off so fast when they drove past the lady. My brother was so freaked out that he won't travel that road anymore, even during the day. Eventually I found out that the lady lives in the woods. Apparently at one time, her family lived on that road. Her father was ill and she tried to take him to the hospital. He died on the way there and she drove around with his body in her car for hours. I guess she has mental health issues and I think she lost the house or got kicked out. I have friends that live off of that street, so when I was talking about it, they knew exactly who it was. I still go on that road, but I haven't seen her since. I do hope she's okay, but I really do not want to run into her again. So this encounter happened many years ago and I was very young. It was in 2001 or 2002 and I was 11 to 12 at the time. My uncle was interested in purchasing some land near Red Oak, Oklahoma. I don't know exactly where, but it was several acres in a very remote area. My father, mother and myself decided to accompany him one Saturday to scope out the property. From our home, it was a little more than a three hour drive but we all love riding in the car. So while it was not going to be the most eventful road trip, we just went to get out of the house. Upon arrival, I remember being very underwhelmed by the place. No houses anywhere near, and hardly even any signs of life at all apart from a few birds. And the wooded area wasn't exactly what I would call picturesque. Still, we parked our car off the road to go explore the woods a little, my uncle was talking about buying the land for hunting, not really my cup of tea. As we walked through the woods, it was a very nice day, but still, something felt off. Everyone in our group remarked about the eerie feeling, but my dad and uncle seemed to laugh it off. My mom had goosebumps and kept looking over her shoulder, which made me on edge too. She was very insistent that it was weird and she wanted to leave saying it felt like she was being watched. After a bit of hiking, I noticed that there was a small red building. I've seen bigger storage sheds in the suburbs, but it looked well built. My uncle said there was nothing about it on the listing, so we went to peek inside. The door was open, and inside there were open cans of food, a ratty blanket on the floor, and it stunk unlike anything I'd ever smelled before. Following this discovery, we all agreed it would be best to get back to the car if there was some crazy hermit living in the woods that we didn't want to be around to find. The only issue is, we'd walked pretty far into the woods and now weren't exactly sure which direction was correct. The eerie feeling really ebbed up and we were all on edge. We ended up trekking another mile before we finally found the road, but we were further down from where we had parked the car, but at least we could just follow the road now. Walking along the road, we came across a truly unsettling sight. Right in the middle of the asphalt was a dark gray cat on fire. I have no idea why a cat was out in the middle of nowhere or how it came to be killed and set alight. Obviously, this had just happened, but there was no one in sight. Naturally, we ran the rest of the way to the car. There was a huge scratch in the paint all down the side of it from the hood to the trunk. Thankfully, that was the only damage, and my dad was able to start it without any trouble, and we drove away as fast as we possibly could. My heart is speeding up just recounting this moment. It's definitely one of the scariest in my life. Needless to say, my uncle did not buy the land, and I'll always remember this terrifying encounter, but like anything over time, I sort of pushed it to the back of my mind and it just became one of those moments you occasionally retell at family get-togethers years later. So much that it's almost just a funny story. The reason I'm sharing this is because I was reminded of it last night while binge-watching some episodes of BuzzFeed Unsolved on YouTube when they shared the story of a family that disappeared in the same area. 
while also looking at some land for sale. The Disappearance of the Jameson Family is the name of the video if you're interested. The family died in the same area we were searching, roughly seven years after we made our trip there. There are many theories about their deaths, including the allegations of some sort of cult in the area, complete with something about dead cats. Coincidence, probably, but the whole story gave me chills. So if my family narrowly avoided being killed by some witches or a cult or whatever, or if we just stumbled upon a hermit who didn't want us in his woods. This is a story that my mother and aunts told me when I was in high school. I'm 21 now and it has never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what happened. My grandfather passed close to a year ago in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died and it caused some issues in my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way. My grandfather, John, was a man who was extremely calloused and old-fashioned. He was bitter, abusive, and a complete macho man. My mother was raised on never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He was also an extreme racist. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. Everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do, like drinking and having affairs just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. He was also not religious at all and found things like faith and hope stupid. This story takes place sometime in the 70s, most likely early to mid-70s. My mom was born in 1965 and remembers this story clearly. My aunt as well remembered this happening, but no one knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. My mother, her three sisters, and her mother were all there and very excited about this. Where we are from, my family is more than accustomed to the woods and has lived in this area for generations. Going into the woods for a fun family activity was nothing out of the ordinary and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwoods road and stopped once they found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out of the car and messing around as kids do after being stuck together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. John began surveying the area and deciding where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled to the family and said he would be right back. The kids and my grandmother didn't think much of this since they're used to the woods, and these woods, in particular, were very familiar to them. They continued unloading and setting up the stuff they brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something far worse. It was a dirt mound that looked like something was buried under it. This mound was about the size of a small person, maybe even child-sized. It was too big to simply be any animal in these woods. There was nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. Scattered amongst the mound were large river rocks. There was no pattern, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be freshly disturbed, as though something was just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted from an average day in the woods to something much darker. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried about it, but she did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry and continued playing while just avoiding the mound. They tried to return to their picnic and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous sunny day and my grandmother wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a dense wall of foliage, blocking their view from anything else inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice of something strange. 
it was immediately clear what it was. Along one of the long branches of the tree hung a noose. It was tied with a rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt can be explained away by nature, but someone had to have placed the noose there. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she first saw it. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started to become very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished. My grandmother, the resilient woman she is, soothed her children and told them it was just left by deer hunters, but she knew in her heart that they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it, at least no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing something in the woods that they began to really panic. My grandmother, as well as the children, began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep in the woods. It sounded as though there were a group of people all singing in deep voices to a beat of a drum. It went in a quick pattern, three steady beats followed by a pause, and then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold of each of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed, it began to increase in volume. It was getting not just louder, but closer. What started out as a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. They waited, fear-ridden, as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as the deep bass began to vibrate in their chest. It was everywhere and constant, as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out to them from the trees. Go, he yelled. Get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen terror on this man. He was a man afraid of nothing, unbothered by the world around him. This was the most emotion any of them had ever seen from him. He saw something in those woods, something that shook his very being to the core. My grandmother began throwing everything back in the car as the kids got in as well. John and my grandmother picked up their things as quickly as possible and threw them all into the car. They had no care for the things they were packing up due to their fear. Food was all over the trunk, and items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car and drove away. This is where the main grunt of the story ends, but one fact from this story is what really has caused me to wonder all these years. My grandfather has refused to ever speak of what he saw. He never told any of the children or my grandmother. Every time this was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told them not to ask again. He never went to the police or told someone outside of the family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself I would ask him one day. Now I can't, and I regret it greatly. By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of the state with other family members and I mostly lost contact with him outside of the occasional happy birthday calls or letters. This story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what happened that day. We weren't close when I got older, and once I learned of all the abuse he caused, I separated myself from him. His death looms over me, and this story still haunts me to this day. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood. Nothing more than a story to spook the little ones at Thanksgiving with. I'm one of the only people in the family who is still curious about what happened. I've always been interested in mysteries, the occult, horror, and conspiracy theories. This story piqued my interest more than any others in the family. Which, by the way, this isn't the only strange story from my family but it is definitely the most strange. I wish I had answers. I hope you all find this story 
as fascinating as I do. I've spent my life in Georgia and love hiking all over, but I must admit North Carolina has the best mountains. For this reason, I frequently drive up there and hike and camp. This time, I went up with my family in an RV and stayed with them in Maggie Valley. The next day, however, I had them drop me off about 10 miles away at the Cold Mountain Trailhead, and I planned to hike up and spend the night and be back down in the morning. I was by no means inexperienced at hiking or camping, but I had never camped alone. On top of that, I didn't bring a pistol. On the way up, the trail was surprisingly strenuous, not necessarily steep. I've hiked some steep stuff out in the west, but more like a ton of ups and downs and feeling like it wouldn't end. Eventually, it began to get darker, and I realized I needed to stop and set up while I still had light. So I stopped about a half a mile short of the summit and figured I would continue in the morning. Nothing eventful happened. I set up camp in a really good spot, ate my food, and went into the tent. At this point, I realized I hadn't run into a single other person my entire way up. This wasn't eerie at the time, but soon would be. I have trouble sleeping and usually lay awake for up to an hour trying to sleep. I thought I heard someone lightly walking around the general area because of the rhythm of the steps. I brushed it off as my mind running wild, but I did pull my big old knife out of my bag and put it next to me in the sleeping bag. That morning, I woke up and ate oatmeal. As I ate, I looked over my tent and noticed a strange bundle of dried twigs and berries tied with green cord propped against my tent. Internally, I was pissing myself but I packed my stuff up and took off within five minutes. And no way I bothered going to the summit. I headed straight down. On the way down, I realized there was a pretty heavy fog, and I ended up on a side trail that eventually ended and I was lost. I used a compass to eventually reorient myself, and I found the trail again. I made it out with no other incident. However, I come to find out the same morning a 27-year-old died on the same section of trail as me, and it's possible I would have run into him had I not gotten lost and rejoined the trail later. His family seemed to have scrubbed the internet of several articles on him. The scariest part was knowing that someone knew where I was and watched me, and I had no clue about them. Also, the circumstances surrounding the guy's death are weird. You can find articles about him. He supposedly fell trying to climb out of a ravine, but he was away from his backpack and it called 911, but he didn't get to speak to anyone on the line. This is a true story, and I've been kind of obsessing over what the fuck happened out there. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible without leaving out key details. I grew up deep in the mountains of Shoshone County, an hour from a grocery store. The wilderness is my peace and my home, but these woods, they are evil, and I never should have come to Washington. My wife's uncle bought some land just north of Spokane, Washington, with a friend of the family. They got it at a significant discount because a nearby aluminum smelter had polluted the ground and it was impossible to use the water beneath it. They had set up two plots and each had a camper to live in. Jay had been progressively getting paranoid and saying people were stalking him and watching him in the trees. About three months into living there, a man wandering through the woods there had an interaction with Jay and ended up attacking him and breaking his jaw. Upon being arrested, the man said he was overcome with a desire to see if he could kill him with a single punch. Two months later, my wife's uncle Jay was murdered in his sleep on the couch in his camper. His friend Kay found him and immediately ran as far away until he stopped to call the police. There was sufficient evidence of who did it and they quickly caught the killer who was a 19-year-old boy who said he simply wanted his bike. 
He beat him to death with a power tool that was lying on the floor nearby, completely bashed his brains in. Kay was completely terrified at all times to be there alone. He had moved in with a family member until eight months later. He ended up with nowhere else to go and he had to return. In constant fear, he finally convinced my pregnant wife and I to come stay with him. The second I turned off the highway onto the property, I was overcome with dread. There were at least 250 crows covering the dirt road up to the property. I didn't sleep whatsoever the first night. I stared into the forest, searching for the cause of my intense fear. The energy of this place was so uncomfortable, and I assumed it was simply just knowing that my wife's uncle Jay was killed here. Even the days were eerie. Never did I have a moment where I didn't feel watched here. My wife and I always had a sense of fear, especially after dark. Things sort of normalized for a while, until one day, Kay began puking and feeling very lightheaded all the time. I took him to the hospital and they said he was fine, probably a flu. At this point, it was the anniversary of Jay's murder. Three days after the date of Jay's death, Kay comes running out of his camper screaming, I can't breathe, waking my wife and I up, and we run out to see what's wrong. Kay had gotten into his car and floored it, crashing into a nearby tree. I run up and peer through the window to see the most intense and most primal fear I have ever seen in someone's eyes. He was gasping and clutching his chest. Moments later, he breathed out one last time, and he was dead. We gave him CPR for 30 minutes until EMS arrived. On July 10th, one year and three days after moving there with Jay, and they both were dead. Now it's only the wife and I alone on the property. Every moment living in fear and not understanding what had happened here. I don't know why we didn't leave right away. One day I come out to get fresh water from a drum we kept and I smell the worst thing I'd ever smelled. The water container had a one inch opening on top and inside the water were bits and pieces of chipmunks like spines and heads. They didn't fall in. Something ripped them apart before putting them inside. The nights were getting worse and worse. I never saw anything other than shadows messing with my eyes. I was nearly always filled with unease and intense fear. Fear in the woods, even at night, is new for me. We all get a little spooked in the thick of the wilderness in pure darkness. But compared to my home, this wasn't even a wilderness. The snapping of branches and pine needles crunching underfoot haunted my every night. The screeching owls loved to chime in right at the height of anxiety. My nights were spent peering into the pines, watching, always waiting for whatever evil to present itself. I knew it was out there, and it wanted me to know it too. One night, my wife and I return home to having the worst feeling I've ever felt. Every second driving up the long dirt road increased my anxiety tenfold. Something bad was ahead, and it was clear. The thick fog shrouded the pines. If it wasn't for the glimmer of the full moon, it would have been pitch black. Everything looked different, although it was right where we left it. Nothing seemed out of place. Looking around, I suddenly see this orange, long-haired, manged cat sitting on a stump. The cat's eyes were so intense, fiery, almost glowing but not quite. The cat, in my mind, was the embodiment of pure evil. I saw darkness in its soul. We started hearing branches snapping, pine needles crunching, seemingly from every direction. The brush was swaying back and forth, clearly indicating something was running within. Here I am still staring at this cat, almost frozen in fear. Suddenly a voice breaks out, echoing throughout the forest. Hello, is anyone out here? A little girl, I thought, but something was off. My gaze finally breaks with the cat, and my eyes dart towards the road. My wife yells back, Hello, are you okay? Anybody? The voice had changed. 
Help. Help me. It was the same person or thing yelling, but as if it was trying to disguise its voice. We yelled back several times without response. Somebody fucking help me. The most intense, shrieking, evil-sounding voice of a woman called out. It cut deep into my body. I'm filled with more intense fear than I can ever describe. But my wife, she's overcome with the need to find this person. And she started to head off into the forest without a word. I grabbed her by the arm, telling her something isn't right. Why won't she respond? She tries to break free from me to go off alone. I tell her to get in the truck and I'll grab the spotlights, but we aren't going on foot. We roll the windows down, and I shine my intensely bright LED lights throughout the forest. We slowly creep down the road, yelling back. As we get further down the road, the voice strikes out. Please, why won't anyone fucking help me? The sounds are difficult to pin down in the woods, but this one was very close. I hit the brakes and stopped immediately. We shine the lights and yell back, searching. There's no sign of anyone, when suddenly the voice explodes into the cabin of the vehicle, as if they were standing right outside my window. Help me. Somebody fucking help me. Leaving my ears hurting and ringing. I hit the gas and didn't look back. We called the police when I hit the highway, and afterwards they said there was nobody around. I picked up our stuff the next day, and my wife gave birth the following day. We never stayed there again after the baby was born. What the hell could do these things? I have never even believed in paranormal things before, but I don't know what else happened. I went camping with my girlfriend about four-ish years ago in the mountains, just east of where we live. We're both a little hippie, so we brought some toys, juggling bags, Diablo, Poi, whatnot, and we thought it might be fun to bring out our recently acquired brass singing bowls. We have three different sizes that produce different tones, with the middle-sized green bowl being our favorite, in both appearance and tone. If you've ever played a singing bowl before, you know they don't just make the tone by themselves, and it can take a little effort to get the tone out cleanly and clearly. In my opinion, that's kind of the fun of the bowls and coaxing the sound out of it. It adds a little bit of necessary skill, and makes the singing bowls an instrument with a little exclusivity. The second night out there, after bedding down for the night, I wake up suddenly to hear the green bowl unmistakably singing, my girlfriend was in the tent with me, so it definitely wasn't her. Again, they don't sing by themselves. They have to be played. So of course both of us were rightly surprised, perplexed, and admittedly freaked out by the fact that this bowl was singing, seemingly of its own accord. She nudged me to see if I was experiencing the same thing as she was, looked at me wide-eyed and said, Are you hearing this too? I nodded for fear that my speech would cause the bowl to stop. After staring at each other for what felt like an eternity, we quietly resolved to make our way over to the zipper flap of the tent and open it just enough to see what was playing our bowl. However, as soon as we started to move, the bowl stopped, and not just like someone stopped playing it and walked away. No, it stopped. The bowl muted no resonating tone whatsoever. It was like someone had grabbed the edge of the bowl, like you would a cymbal on a drum kit, and silenced it instantly. After the muting, we rushed ourselves out of the tent in the hopes that maybe we would catch sight or sound of whatever it was that decided to stop by and play with our singing bowl. But alas, nothing was there. No footprints, no trail no indication that anything at all had been anywhere near the bowl. We still cannot explain what happened that night, and it's one of those stories that even now sends a bit of shiver down my spine and makes my hair stand a little on end. Whatever played our bowl that night didn't feel hostile or angry, maybe curious and playful. 
but it definitely didn't want us to know what it was. I was camping out in the desert with four friends, three females and my older buddy. He's a bit weird but cool. We're all on drugs, it's one of the girls' birthdays, and while they're all sleeping in a camper, we're sleeping in our individual tents. It starts to rain pretty heavy, night falls, and everyone returns to their designated spaces. The girls are loud, but still I'm starting to fall asleep when I hear one of them call my name directly. I wake up. They're now yelling at me to come to the camper. Well, alright. I get dressed, unzip the tent, slosh through some mud, knock on the camper door, and they let me inside. They all look pale-faced and shook. I ask them what's wrong, and they tell me something is outside of the camper. I look around, and the party stayed at the van, rolled my eyes, and told them there was nothing out there. But they insisted, and made me wait with them until they heard another sound. I remind them that they're on drugs, so it was probably just auditory hallucinations, but they swear it isn't, and I finally relent and sit down and wait. Minutes pass, nothing but the pitter-patter of raindrops, and then suddenly a scratching sound. It sounded just outside the camper. I tell them it's probably a tree branch, but they say it's something else and to go look. I sigh. I grab a flashlight and head out into the rain to do a circle of the camper. Nothing there. No footprints in the mud. No tree branches anywhere close by either. Weird. But there's nothing there. So I go back in and tell them the coast is clear. They're shook and still unsure. So I offer to just sleep there on the floor for a bit. I'm starting to doze off again when I hear a voice whisper. Can you hear me? Yes, I say, and start to wake up. What's up? And the girls are all silent. One of them finally stirs and says, You heard that too. It wasn't me. I sit up and look around. The other two girls are asleep. We're staring into each other's eyes when suddenly, we both, clear as day, hear a child laughing in the other corner of the van. What the fuck was that? I exclaim, and the girl who was awake says that she's heard the laughing before, and that's what scared her. So we wake up the other two to see if they were messing with us. They weren't. They were annoyed. So now I'm thinking, maybe it's someone's phone. We find all the phones and out them together as well as any other electronic devices. Suddenly there's a loud creaking sound just outside the front door. Christ, I yell out thinking maybe it was my guy friend. No response. I grab a broom and slowly open the door and peer outside, but there's no light and I can't see shit. I close the door and I'm freaking out. Now I'm wondering if some local townies or other campers were fucking with us. More scratching on the side of the camper. Suddenly I remember my friend is all alone, so I start to yell at him to wake up and to bring his guns over because I think there might be people fucking with us. After yelling for him loudly for 10 minutes, he finally wakes up and yells back that he'll be right over. He gets there, and immediately I feel more secure. Two grown-ass men. We can handle this. I catch him up to speed, and he just mocks us and reminds us we're on drugs and imagining it, but I swear it's something real, and he agrees to stay in the camper on the floor with me ready to charge into the night if need be. We go quiet. We wait five minutes. Ten. Fifteen. We're falling asleep. And then the giggles. The damn child laughter returns from just outside the van. My friend thinks it's one of the girls messing with us and tells us to just go to sleep. They swear it's not them, but he doesn't believe them and just lays back down. Not ten seconds later, there's a loud creak sound again and scratching, and it sounds like someone is just outside. He sits up alert, looks at our horrified faces with the same expression, we told you so, and he rushes out of the camper into the darkness and rain, and we hear him fly around the van yelling, 
but he comes back and reports. No one was there. We start to talk about the campground being haunted. Old burying ground, maybe. We don't know. At this point, we're jabbering on just to hear our own voices. We all agree to just stay awake until the morning. The sun rises. The rain dries up. We pack up and leave. I'm getting gas in a local town when suddenly the thoughts hit me. I google, psst, can you hear me? And this is when I discover the evil Tron. Yes, friends, a small, sadistic, sinister electronic device that emits creepy sounds and can be attached to any metal surface. It was my weird friend. He had hid it underneath the girl's whippet canister. In fact, it wasn't theirs. It was his canister, and they lifted it from his tent while he slept, but he knew. He knew what they'd try, and he tricked them, like a Trojan horse, into bringing the device into their camper. I was collateral damage, and he just went with it, silently chuckling to himself. The mastermind. The damn mastermind. The fallout was bad between him and the girls, but I thought it was the best prank I'd ever seen pulled off. To this day, bravo. I was far up north, far north British Columbia, Canada, working in an oil rig camp out in the woods. I was working as a cook. I went out one afternoon for a smoke on the back deck. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. It was a very quiet, still winter day. It was snowing those kind of big snowflakes that make it look like the world's moving in slow motion. So, as I was standing there smoking, just staring off in the distance, not looking at anything in particular, you know, looking left, right, up and down, and at my feet, whatever, I felt something looking at me. Then I looked straight ahead. About thirty feet or less in front of me was the tree line in the forest, and directly in front of me, in between two trees, I see the most gigantic wolf I've ever seen. This thing sitting looked like it was the size of a man standing. It was massive, sitting there and just staring right at me. We locked eyes, then I looked away for a split second and then looked back, and it was gone. I don't know. It just gave me the weirdest feeling. It was definitely like, hey, I see you. I could eat you, but I won't. Okay, bye. It's something I will always remember. Two or three times a year, we vacation in a cabin in the wilderness. Me, my wife, and our three young children and two dogs. I'm no stranger to the wild, and have made a lot of multiple day and week solo trips in national parks, and even in the Arctic Circle. Yesterday, I went for a ten mile solo hike. At the farthest point, after two hours, I heard my children arguing, playing, crying laughing and calling me from the forest. I was totally alone, and my first instinct was to run through the thick brush and trees to where the sound was coming from, but then I realized that it couldn't be my kids, and that I should just walk on and ignore it. I decided to walk back to the cabin. The whole family was there and never left. I know how my children sound, and I swear it was them. Later I realized the combination of all the sounds, laughing, crying, and playing, and whatnot, made no sense. What was this experience? What did I hear? My brother is two years older and we've probably spent tens of thousands of hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building forts or BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, we've traveled across the US exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, 
hunting whitetail, mule deer, wild boar, and whatever else. Since 2016, when we get the time off, I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was different, and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We're both mid-twenties, and it was 2019. This was probably my fifth time hunting the area, and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few country roads which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple of miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails, basically the middle of nowhere. The nearest main road is probably 8 to 10 miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We spent the next day scouting and tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked, then ate, had some beers and bullshitted. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell that he was disturbed when I went to ask him what's wrong and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet so I think it was around 4.30 a.m. We sat in my tent and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds. Different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on because what I was hearing didn't seem real and in the moment I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke and at the time I felt like I could feel the energy around me almost like my body was covered in white noise if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped it started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground, and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things we drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth every single one. My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But at the time, we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. It just seems odd it was still the middle of the night and we were so far removed from any nearby communities or industry to hear and experience this occurrence. This happened circa 1971 or 1972, when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Montevallo, Alabama. My mother is the oldest of five children, and she has three sisters and a brother, who's the baby of the family. One weekend in the cooler months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family, my grandmother, my mother, and all my aunts and uncles, so seven people in total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle, if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare and there were lots of leaves on the ground. 
The wooded area was just off a dirt road, so this was a fairly rural area they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembered the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. He hid with them. The man in the driver's seat got out, dragged a woman's body out of the car, and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding, and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured and obviously didn't want the help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he dragged her out of the car. So my father cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety. Well, on the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seat right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see he was carrying a rifle, but everyone was careful not to give away what they'd just seen. The man struck up small talk with my grandfather, asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he'd just taken his family out for target practice with a rifle. The man told him to have a nice day and continue driving. The next day, my grandfather went back out to that spot in the woods. There was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. She started screaming, he killed that lady, he killed that lady. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one thing about it, I guess. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work, just before the kids left for school. She told them not to take the bus that day, that she would come home and pick them up and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because that car is waiting for you at the bus stop. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you to Jay Nightmares for sourcing and translating these stories and lending his voice too. Be sure to check out his channel for stories translated from Japanese. You're unlikely to have heard them before. I'll put the link to his channel in the description. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Tom, Daniel Whaler, May 2, 2003, Sarah Chifalo, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya. Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, this bad kitty, your pappy's dilly, Laney, tripping balls through history, 
Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoid, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.